Victoria Adjo Climbier was born on the 2nd of November 1991 in a bobo on the Ivory Coast of West Africa. She came from a big family and was the fifth of seven children of her parents, Francis and Bert. Victoria's parents were Christians and raised their children to be good and respectable. They never smacked them and stated that there was never a reason to because they were so well behaved. The family lived in a rented three-bedroomed home in Ivory Coast's largest city, Abidjan, where Francis had worked as a waiter at an international hotel. Victoria was consistently happy throughout her life and was referred to as having the brightest smile. No matter the day or the circumstances, there was never a time where Victoria couldn't find happiness in her day. Every person she ever encountered said that her joy and spirit had stood out to them. The most noticeable thing about Victoria being her love of dancing and singing, something that she would do wherever she went. The family didn't have a lot of money and Bert has described that in Africa they don't have a benefit system. Therefore, it is instead common practice for extended family members who are well off to always help the poorer ones. In October of 1998, Bert's maternal aunt, Marie Therese Coelho, arrived at the Columbier household. Marie Therese was based in Paris where she worked for an airline company. She had been living for some time in France and told Francis and Bert that the reason for her visit was that she was prepared to take back one of their children to France and arrange for their education. The idea of one of their children receiving a good Western opportunity and a better life was too much to turn down. It was soon decided that Victoria would be the one to go. Bert recalled that it was a frightening prospect and she pleaded with Marie Therese to take care of her baby. But Marie Therese was extravagantly reassuring. Bert recalled that Marie Therese had picked up a Bible and swore on it stating, I will treat her as my grandchild, I will help her to study, and one day she will return to take care of you and help other people. Being that Marie Therese was somebody they knew well, and she was the head of the family, a French citizen, and apparently, from their perception, incredibly welfare, this was the opportunity of a lifetime. Unbeknownst to the Climbier family, was that Marie Therese was not there out of the kindness of her heart and was not there for reasons as genuine as she had led them to believe. In fact, she had only wanted Victoria to help her access better state benefits back in France and she believed that having a child would prioritise her on the housing list. The day soon came for Victoria to head off to her new home across the horizon and she was excited. She wore her new pink tracksuit in preparation for the cooler climate and had her favourite doll tucked underneath her arm. The Climbiers never took down the address of Marie Therese's home in France, but they felt there was no reason to, as she was family and they had every trust in her. Another thing that the Climbiers had not known was that Victoria had not actually been Marie Therese's first choice of child. She had originally planned to take a little girl called Anna and had filled out all of the necessary paperwork and obtained a passport for the child. However, when the time had come to take Anna back to Paris, the parents of the little girl had changed their minds and told Marie Therese that they didn't want their daughter to go. This was when Marie Therese had shown up at the Climbier household to offer to take one of their children in replacement. When the time came to travel, the pair did so on Marie Therese's passport, which had described Victoria as her daughter Anna. Anna had been the name of the other child that Marie Therese had previously planned to bring from the Ivory Coast. However, on short notice, and also to avoid the extra costs and hassle that came with changing the documentation, Marie Therese had decided to just pretend that Victoria was in fact Anna. Throughout her life with Marie Therese, Victoria was almost stripped of her identity, often being referred to and introduced to people as Anna. 
To get Victoria through border controls, she also gave Victoria hair extensions to resemble the photograph of Anna, the actual girl in the false passport who had longer hair than Victoria. When the pair arrived in France in November of 1998, Marie-Therese immediately used Victoria to access child benefits for extra income. In the beginning, Marie-Therese seemed prepared to honour her promise to make sure that Victoria received a proper education. Shortly after her arrival in France, Victoria was enrolled at the Jean Mullin Primary School in Villa Pinte. However, by December of 1998, Victoria only attended half the time, and when she was at school, staff worried about Victoria's tendencies to fall asleep in class. Marie-Therese tried to explain Victoria's absences by claiming that she had medical issues and needed rest. The head teacher, Monsieur Donnet, also recalled Victoria's aunt mentioning that Victoria was suffering from some form of dermatological condition. The authorities now threatened action over Victoria's non-attendance, and sometime in the spring of 1999, Marie-Therese gave the school notice that she was removing Victoria so she could receive treatment in London for her apparent skin condition. The home address of a lady named Esther Acker was given as the forwarding address. Miss Acker was a distant relative of Marie Therese's. Victoria last said goodbye to her classmates on the 25th of March 1999. It was at this point that Monsieur Donnet noticed that Victoria had a shaved head and was wearing a wig. For a long while, before leaving France, Marie Therese had been claiming benefits that she was not entitled to. The French benefits agency was trying to recover money for these benefits, and this could also have influenced her decision to leave for the UK. In April of 1999, the pair arrived in Ealing, West London. However, Victoria was struggling with her new environment and could not speak English. When they arrived in the UK, Marie-Therese and Victoria first went to Acton and moved into a double room in a bed and breakfast in Twyford Crescent. The reservation had been made in France and lasted until the 1st of May 1999. At around 4.30pm on the 25th of April 1999, Victoria and Marie Therese paid an unannounced visit to Miss Acker. Miss Acker had just come home from work when she heard the doorbell ring in her house in Hanwell, West London. Victoria was introduced as Anna. Despite being somewhat taken aback by their presence, Miss Acker invited Marie Therese and Victoria inside. The first thing that Miss Acker noticed about Victoria was that she was wearing a wig. This was also remarked upon by Miss Acker's daughter, Grace. Miss Acker removed the wig from Victoria's head to discover that she had no hair and her scalp was covered with patchy marks. She didn't know any odd behaviour coming from Victoria towards Marie Therese at the time, so didn't suspect anything was to be concerned about. The following day after meeting Miss Acker, Marie Therese and Victoria visited Ealing's homeless persons unit because they needed somewhere to live when their week in Twyford Crescent ran out. The unit agreed to provide them with emergency accommodation in a hostel situated in Nickel Road, Halsden, and they moved in around the 1st of May 1999. During 1999, the Columbier family in Ivory Coast had hit hard times. The hotel where Francis had worked closed and an alternative business venture of Francis's had failed. They moved to a one-room shack in Township with only a curtain for privacy. It did not even warrant a postal address. It seemed that they had made the right decision by Victoria. Over the next few weeks, Victoria and Marie Therese attended Ealing Social Services several times to collect subsistence payments and on one occasion to complain about the standard of their accommodation. During this period, concerns first started to emerge. A number of Ealing staff who saw Marie Therese and Victoria together during May of 1999 
noticed the marked difference between Marie Therese's appearance and how she was always well dressed and that of Victoria, who was far scruffier. Deborah Gaunt, who first saw the two of them together on the 24th of May, 1999, went as far as to say that she thought Victoria looked like an advertisement for ActionAid. It is unclear how Victoria passed her days during the first months that she spent in the Nickel Road Hostel. No effort was made to enrol her in any form of educational or daycare activity, and there is no evidence to indicate that she had any friends or playmates. In June of that year, Victoria began to show what may have been early signs of deliberate physical harm. Miss Acker, who had not seen Victoria since her visit six weeks earlier, bumped into her and Marie Therese on the street on the 14th of June. Victoria was wearing a dress with long sleeves, leaving only her face and hands exposed. Miss Acker had noticed a fresh scar on Victoria's right cheek, which Marie Therese told her had been caused when Victoria fell from an escalator. Later that same day, Victoria met Carl Manning for the first time. He'd been driving a bus boarded by Marie Therese four days before, and the two had fallen into conversation. According to Manning, he had given Marie Therese his telephone number, and she had called him a few days later, inviting him to visit her at Nickel Road. This appears to have been the start of their relationship. Miss Acker, meanwhile, was growing more concerned now for Victoria's safety and made the decision to anonymously ring Brent social workers, saying that she feared that Victoria was being abused. She also thought the accommodation was unsuitable for a child because it was dirty, cramped and ill-equipped. She began to make regular visits to them and keep an eye on Victoria and was shocked to see how much weight the little girl had lost in such a short space of time. Miss Acker once again made a call to Brent to check on progress and was reassured that it would be looked into. Unfortunately, it never was. On July the 6th, Marie Therese moved them into the 267 Somerset Gardens Tottenham flat of her new boyfriend, Carl Manning, a bus driver in his late 20s. The flat had only one bedroom and had to accommodate all three of them. The flat contained two sofa beds. Carl Manning said that Victoria slept on one of them and he and Marie Therese slept on the other. This arrangement continued until October, when Victoria's bed was thrown out and she began to spend her nights in the bathroom. Marie Therese secured work, so began to leave Victoria with Priscilla Cameron, an experienced but unregistered childminder, and her children. Five weeks into Victoria being cared for by her childminder, she would typically be dropped off at around 7am and not be picked up until the evening, sometimes as late as 10pm. Victoria didn't seem to mind this. It seemed that this would be the only escapism and the chance of a normal childhood that she received. She was able to watch television, draw, play, and often took a nap after her lunch. Her English improved and she appears to have struck up a good relationship with Mrs Cameron's adult son Patrick whom she loved to show how to dance. The pair had gotten on very well, and Patrick had become a good companion to Victoria, remarking, Victoria had the most beautiful smile that lit up the room. Mrs Cameron provided all of Victoria's meals on the days that she came to stay. When Marie Therese would come to collect Victoria, however, it seemed that her behaviour would noticeably alter. She became more withdrawn, and she no longer wanted to dance and play. Victoria tended to look down at the floor, rubbing her hands together whenever her aunt was present. Mrs Cameron noticed that Marie Therese would often speak very harshly to Victoria, referring to her as a wicked girl. On several occasions, Victoria turned up at Mrs Cameron's house with a number of small cuts to her fingers. When questioned about them, Marie Therese said that they had been caused by Victoria playing with razor blades. On the evening of the 13th of July, 1999, Marie Therese turned up unexpectedly at Mrs Cameron's doorstep in an agitated state. 
She asked Mrs Cameron to take Victoria for good, because apparently Manning was not prepared to tolerate Victoria living with them anymore. Mrs Cameron refused but agreed to take Victoria in for one night, because the poor child was looking so ill. When she arrived, Victoria was wearing a baseball cap pulled down over her eyebrows. When Mrs Cameron removed it, she saw what she took to be a burn the size of a 50 pence piece on Victoria's face. Mr Cameron also noticed three circular marks on Victoria's lower right jaw, which looked to him like injuries that had been healing for a little while. Both he and Mrs Cameron noticed Victoria's eyes were also bloodshot, and Mrs Cameron also observed a loose piece of skin hanging from her right eyelid. Mrs Cameron's opinion as to the likely cause of these injuries is shown by the fact that she asked Marie Therese who had burned and beaten Victoria. Marie Therese replied that all of the injuries had been self-inflicted. Mrs Cameron gave Victoria a clean pair of pyjamas and put her to bed. Later that evening, she heard groaning coming from the room and went to see what was the matter. Victoria was asleep but Mrs Cameron saw that her face was swollen and her fingers were oozing pus. Mrs Cameron called her daughter Avril to come and look. On the 14th of July 1999, Mrs Cameron's daughter Avril became so concerned over Victoria's mounting injuries that she took her to Central Middlesex Hospital at around 11am. However, once there, Victoria was reluctant to talk about how she got her injuries. Victoria was seen by Dr. Bainan within an hour of her arrival. In his view, there was a strong possibility that this was a case of non-accidental injury. Following a two-hour examination, the doctor pointed to Victoria's thigh and asked Avril if she knew what the marks were. When she replied no, the doctor went on to inform her that they were cigarette burns. Just over a week later, on the 24th of July 1999, Victoria was back in hospital yet again. This time, it was the North Middlesex Hospital and Marie Therese had been the one to bring her in. Her most urgent injury yet was a serious scald to the face. Marie Therese explained that Victoria had tried to get rid of the itching scabies by holding her own head under scalding water. Victoria's burns were so serious that she was admitted to the paediatric ward, known as Rainbow Ward, where she stayed for the next 13 nights. One thing shone through the appalling facial disfigurement in the photographs recorded. Victoria was still smiling. No matter what Victoria went through, hardships, poverty, abuse, she always kept the smile upon her face. There was in fact nothing that could destroy her spirit. Like everyone that met Victoria, they were charmed by her. The nurses treating her took to her as she recuperated and even gave her a pair of pink wellies to play in. Her twirling figure down the wards had entranced everyone. One nurse would take her to see the babies in the neonatal ward and often brought her sweets and treats. She was described by all of the hospital staff as a little ray of sunshine. But nurses noted a change when Marie Therese arrived. They recorded that the relationship was more like that of master and servant rather than mother and daughter. Other notes recorded a belt buckle mark on Victoria's body. Once, Victoria had been so frightened when Marie Therese had arrived that she wet herself. During her fortnight hospital stay, social services never once asked Victoria what had happened. Victoria left the North Middlesex Hospital with Marie Therese at approximately 8pm on the 6th of August 1999. They went straight back to Carl Manning's flat in Somerset Gardens, where Victoria was to spend the remaining seven months of her life. Police Constable PC Karen Jones was assigned to check up on Victoria. However, she never once made a visit through fear of catching scabies from the furniture, and no health visitor would make up a following visit after Victoria's hospital admission. Back at Carl Manning's flat, where Victoria and Marie Therese were now living, they were assigned a social worker. 
Lisa Arthurwere. She is just qualified with only 18 months experience. She needs to be closely supervised, but she isn't. In August, Lisa made her first of two visits to Carl Manning's flat. The flat was better than many that she had seen. It was neat, clean, and Victoria was well presented. Lisa did not speak directly to Victoria, however, or address the fact that she was not receiving an education. Lisa left the flat satisfied and scheduled another visit for in a couple of weeks' time. Little does Lisa know is that Victoria is now being forced to sleep in the bathtub every night. Living in constant fear and receiving regular beatings mean that she has now become incontinent. She had soaked the sofa on which she slept, so Carl made her go to bed in a bin liner in the bathtub. This had also prompted him to hit Victoria. He recalled that he began by slapping her, but by the end of July, he had started using his fists. Victoria was now also forced to sleep in her own excrement in a room without heat or light. It was now winter. Carl Manning and Marie Therese often place food on a plastic plate but Victoria's hands are also tied. She could only eat by pushing her face into the plate like a dog. For the remaining four months of her short life, Victoria is all alone. She is starved and tortured daily. Miss Arthurwere made the second of her two pre-announced visits to Somerset Gardens on the 28th of October, 1999. Victoria seems to have been all but ignored during this visit as she sat on the floor playing with a doll. The fact that she was still not attending school was raised during the conversation, but no questions seem to have been asked about how Victoria was spending her days. According to Manning, Victoria was told how to behave in front of Miss Arthurwere. Victoria was said to be sleeping on the remaining sofa bed, with Manning and Marie Therese sharing a newly purchased bed on the other side of the room. At the end of the visit, Victoria suddenly jumped up and shouted at Miss Arthurwere. She said words to the effect that she did not respect her or her mother, and that she should be given a house. This behaviour surprised Miss Arthurwere at the time. During the course of their conversation, Miss Arthurwere told Marie Therese that the council only accommodated children who were at serious risk of harm, and that in the council's view, Victoria was not at such risk. It may be no coincidence that within three days of this conversation, Marie Therese contacted Miss Arthurwere to make allegations, which, if true, would have placed Victoria squarely within that category. In November, Marie Therese rang social services hysterically, alleging that Carl had sexually assaulted Victoria. Marie Therese turned up at social services with Victoria and her alleged abuser Carl. When it was explained to Marie Therese that before she would receive her council house, Victoria would need to be examined and Carl arrested, she immediately withdrew the allegations. Marie Therese began to attend church with Victoria, the Mission Ensemble Poor Christ, a church which meets in a hall close to Borough High Street where she says Victoria's condition has been caused by devils. On the 24th of February, Marie Therese took Victoria to church once again. A member of the congregation seen Victoria and insisted that she be taken to hospital. The pastor here was Pascal Arone. He had a detailed recollection of Victoria's appearance at this stage. Despite the season, Victoria was dressed in heavy clothing that covered all of her body, apart from her head and hands. He noticed wounds on both and advised Marie Therese to cut Victoria's hair shorter so that the injuries to her scalp could breathe. Marie Therese told him about Victoria's incontinence and he formed the view that she was possessed by an evil spirit. He advised that the problem could be solved by prayer. By the 19th of February 2000, Victoria was very ill. On this day, which was a Saturday, Marie Therese took her to another church, the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God, housed in the old Rainbow Theatre on Seven Sisters Road. Audrey Hartley Martin, 
who was assisting Pastor Alvaro Lima in the administration of the 3pm service, noticed the two of them coming up the stairs. They were shouting at each other and Victoria seemed to be having difficulty walking. The pair were disturbing the service, so Miss Hartley Martin took Victoria downstairs to the crash. She noticed that Victoria was shivering and she asked if she was cold. Victoria replied that she was not cold but she was hungry. Miss Hartley Martin obtained some biscuits for her and Victoria hid them in her pocket when Marie Therese came down to collect her. Miss Hartley Martin said in evidence that she did not seek to ensure Victoria received medical attention because she was not aware that the child was ill. At the end of the service, Pastor Lima spoke to Marie Therese about the difficulties she was having with Victoria, particularly her incontinence. He expressed the view that Victoria's problems were due to possession by an evil spirit and that he would spend the week fasting on Victoria's behalf. He believed that he made it clear that Victoria was not expected to fast herself. Marie Therese was advised to bring Victoria back to church the following Friday morning. According to Pastor Lima, Friday was the day on which prayers were said for deliverance from witchcraft, bad luck and everything bad or evil. The events of the next week unfolded as follows. On the Sunday, Marie Therese and Victoria returned to church where they were seen by Pastor Salso Jr. Apparently, Victoria was quiet and well behaved during the visit. On Wednesday, Marie Therese phoned Pastor Lima in the evening and told him Victoria's behaviour had improved, in that she had ceased to cover the flat in excrement. On Thursday, Marie Therese phoned Miss Hartley Martin and told her that Victoria had been asleep for two days and had not eaten or drank anything. By the evening of the same day, Marie Therese was sufficiently concerned enough to bring Victoria to the church and ask for help. Pastor Lima advised them to go straight to the hospital and a minicab was called. Mr Salman Pinabasa, the minicab driver, was sufficiently concerned enough about the condition Victoria was in to take her instead to the nearby Tottenham ambulance station. She was then taken by ambulance to the North Middlesex Hospital and admitted to the casualty unit. On arrival, Victoria was unconscious and very cold. Her temperature was 27 degrees Celsius. Initial attempts to warm her up were unsuccessful and Dr. Alsford arrived around midnight. Her examination of Victoria was limited because her first wish was to increase Victoria's temperature, which at this point was now 28.7 degrees Celsius. A team from the Paediatric Intensive Care Unit at St Mary's Hospital arrived at 2.30am. Victoria was then transferred to St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, where she remained in critical condition with severe hyperthermia and multi-system failure. The medical staff were unable to straighten her legs. Over the hours that followed, Victoria suffered a number of episodes of respiratory and cardiac arrest. Her respiratory, cardiac and renal systems began to fail. At around 3pm, Victoria went into cardiac arrest for the last time. Resuscitation was attempted, but Victoria did not respond. She was declared dead at 3.15pm on the 25th of February 2000. She was 8 years and 3 months old. Her death had been caused by multiple injuries arising from months of ill treatment and abuse by her great aunt, Marie Therese, and her great aunt's partner, Carl John Manning. On the 25th of February 2000, with no successful contact made with Victoria, Haringey Social Services closed the Victoria Columbia case. Management instructions to Lisa regarding Victoria read, Complete appropriate paperwork then NFA. NFA stands for no further action. As well as being forced to spend much of her time in inhuman conditions, Victoria was also beaten on a regular by both Marie Therese and Carl Manning. According to Manning, Marie Therese used to strike Victoria on a daily basis 
sometimes using a variety of weapons. These included a shoe, a hammer, a coat hanger and a wooden cooking spoon. The forensic examination of the flat after Manning's arrest revealed traces of Victoria's blood on the walls, on his football boots and on the undersole of one of his trainers. He also admitted to sometimes using a bicycle chain to beat Victoria. A post-mortem examination was carried out the following day by Dr Nathaniel Carer. He found the cause of death to be hyperthermia, which had arisen in the context of malnourishment, a damp environment and restricted movement. He also found 128 separate injuries on Victoria's body, showing that she had been beaten with a range of sharp and blunt instruments. No part of her body had been spared. Marks on her wrists and ankles indicated that her arms and legs had been tied together. It was the worst case of deliberate harm to a child he had ever seen. During police interviews, both claimed that Victoria was possessed by demons. Detectives searched their flat for forensic evidence and found that Carl had tried to cover up evidence of abuse by cleaning it with bleach. They also found a passport in the flat which seemed to confirm the dead girl as Anna, but detectives soon realised that the photo in the passport is not that of the girl lying dead in the London mortuary. They managed to track down and contact Victoria's real parents by establishing which family Marie Therese had targeted. Victoria's parents then had to make the terrible 3,000 mile journey to identify their dead daughter. Some of Carl's statements were almost incomprehensible. You could beat her and she would not cry at all. She could take the beatings and pain like anything. Marie Therese was arrested on suspicion of neglect at the hospital at 11.35pm on the 25th of February 2000. She told the police, it's terrible, I have just lost my child. Carl Manning was arrested the following afternoon as he returned to his flat. Both were subsequently charged with Victoria's murder and were convicted at the Central Criminal Court on the 12th of January 2001. But whilst Carl does show some shame, Marie Therese shows no remorse for her actions and her behaviour in court shocked everyone. With one spectator commenting, the way she chuckled in such a menacing way and laughed dismissively. Yes, it made the hair stand on the back of my neck. This is the only time I have genuinely felt myself in the presence of evil. It is during the trial that it emerged that Marie Therese also used the hammer to break Victoria's toes. But neither Carl nor Marie Therese once give a satisfactory explanation as to why they treated Victoria the way they did. One suggestion is that Marie Therese thought she would be able to access more benefits with a child. When this did not happen, she took her frustrations out on Victoria. The jury took four days to reach a verdict, and almost a year after Victoria's death, both defendants were found guilty. They both received life imprisonment. Upon hearing her sentence, Marie Therese shrieked at the top of her voice, refused to sit down, and when she did, despite being a convicted murderer, denied any blame. Unbelievably, she tried to shift the blame onto the most undeserving. She turned on the parents of Victoria, accusing them of not being properly married. One of the witnesses is Lisa Arthurwara, Victoria's social worker. She was obviously in a very fragile state. The press had also not wasted any time in demonising her. Lisa had been responsible for Victoria for the last seven months of her life, and in this time, Lisa saw her for a total of just 30 minutes. Two experienced senior doctors were also found to have failed Victoria. When Victoria's childminder first admitted her to hospital fearing abuse, it was consultant paediatrician Dr Mary Schwartz who decided that her cuts were due to scabies. Two weeks later, when Victoria returned to hospital, the consultant Dr Mary Rossiter did think that Victoria was being abused 
but confused colleagues by writing able to discharge on her notes. In total, there were 12 missed opportunities where professionals could have acted to save Victoria's life. Warning phone calls were never followed up on, checks were not made on stories told by Victoria's great aunt, medical misdiagnosis, and throughout, a total failure to engage with the little girl who should have been the centre of everybody's concern. Lord Laming remarked, This was not a failing on the part of one service, it was the failing on the part of every service. The whole child protection system was later overhauled. A new Act of Parliament was brought in, and new guidance issued to social workers. The government also set up a new regulatory agency, the General Social Care Council, as well as the Social Care Institute for Excellence, designed to promote higher standards of practice. Victoria's father, Francis Clumbier, says he doesn't regard Victoria's life as lost, because of the chance that it created to change childcare for the better. He and his wife started a campaign to build a school for children in the Ivory Coast. It was hoped that by providing education there, other parents wouldn't feel the need to let their children be taken away. That dream became a reality, and their newly built school now teaches 360 children. Victoria was laid to rest by her parents in her hometown in the Ivory Coast with them remarking, do not let Victoria's death be in vain. Sadly, the vital changes were not successful enough and led to other failures years later in cases such as Baby P, a two-year-old child who was tortured to death by his mother and stepfather and was failed by numerous social workers who also failed to spot his injuries. In a 2008 interview with the BBC, Victoria's mother Bert said, I'm shocked by the local institutions who did not take the responsibility to follow the green paper to ensure the same thing does not happen to another child. After Victoria, there are many children who have died in tragic circumstances. Nothing has changed and that's why I'm shocked by local institutions. They did not take responsibility. They gave me their word and I was betrayed. When asked if she had any anger towards those responsible for killing her daughter, Mrs. Clumbier said, When you lose a child, it's never easy. At first, it makes your heart bleed, and gradually, you have to try and forgive what has happened and pray for the person's soul. In life, one must always forgive. <laughs>